oil spill. Our first presenter, unfortunately, was not able to join us in person, but we have a video um, taped lecture that he has uh, sent in advance. So I'm going to introduce Andy Kane, who is coming to us uh, from the University of Florida. Um, My name is Andy Kane, and I'm honored to contribute to this panel discussion focusing on integrating sciences for the betterment of communities and better science. I'm pleased to be working with my colleagues Brian Mayer and Sima Finn, where together we can hopefully make for a meaningful case study at this conference regarding social science environmental health collaborations focusing on Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I'm sorry that I cannot be here in person with you today. I'm actually in the field, shepherding a large-scale project-related outreach effort in northern Florida. But let me start out with a brief self-introduction. And um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank Phil Brown, Stephanie Knutson, and the other organizational staff for their vision, putting this all together, and bringing us here today. Thanks, of course, is also due to the National uh, Institutes for Environmental Health Sciences for their important support. So I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental and Global Health in the College of Public Health and Health Professions at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. I teach graduate level classes in aquatic systems and environmental health and in scientific communications for environmental and public health. And I direct uh, master's and PhD programs in One Health and in environmental health. Um, our department and college developed the first accredited One Health graduate programs in the country. My research focuses on aquatic toxicology and pathology as it relates to environmental health. A lot of my work looks at low-level exposure outcomes at the molecular, biochemical, and tissue level and discerns functional outcomes at the level of the whole organism. Coming from a College of Public Health and Health Professions, my environmental health research also bridges to support public health issues affecting communities and populations. So the case study that Brian, Sima, and I will share with you today is derived in large part from an NIEHS-supported consortium grant to address public health outcomes associated with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and its effect on coastal communities. Let's take a moment and start out with the grant proposal itself and the vision it took to bring together folks from different sciences to build a research team that could begin to address real community needs. That vision came from the consortium project principal investigator, Glenn Morris, who's the director of the University of Florida's Emerging Pathogens Institute. In many cases, investigative researchers, even in community-based sciences, respond to requests for proposals by carefully understanding the goals of the funding opportunity, doing some soul searching about what tools are really available and well honed in their programs and those of their colleagues, and discerning how their proposed team will be deft at using their tools to highlight their objectives that will hopefully dovetail closely with the stated funding opportunity. In, in our research consortium, Dr. Morris did just that, but also pooled a wide range of resources and met with a variety of research colleagues, including Brian and me and included Gulf Coast community partners that we knew or had worked with. We discussed how such a research consortium, if funded, might functionally address oil spill related problems and concerns in these communities. Our community partners were not just pulled in for the sake of the grant proposal. They were folks that our team had worked with over time, and as needed, they fostered bringing additional partners on board from the communities to fill gaps. So from the get-go, the discussions and research aims were developed with community members and the scientists together. The sense of ownership of the potential proposal 
was shared from the very beginning. Everyone had to work together to bring the right stuff to the table in order to prioritize needs, discern what was doable to conduct meaningful research that benefited the communities, and that fostered meaningful and functional science. With this team approach and Glenn's orchestration, our consortium proposal was submitted with three primary foci based on the understanding coastal community needs associated with the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. These included looking at, one, mental health as it related to individual well-being and family dynamics, two, social well-being and resiliency within communities, and three, seafood safety for coastal residents, many of whom have relied on coastal fisheries for a livelihood for generations and who may eat a lot of seafood based either on preferences or their need to put protein on the table. So from the start, you have a neuropsychologist, that's Lynn Gratton from the University of Maryland, who's not here today, but who's been a vital part of our team and its overall success. A social scientist, Brian Mayer, and an aquatic toxicologist, that would be me. And community outreach experts, Tracy Irani and Angie Lindsay, coming together with an administration support core to somehow benefit from transdisciplinary science that can address public health needs in Gulf Coastal communities. Five years ago, I would have thought this to be an unlikely team to submit a grant proposal with. But this time it was intuitive and it made sense. And it availed a novel opportunity to do something meaningful for coastal Gulf communities. I didn't know it then, but this was going to be one of the most exciting projects that I had ever engaged in. It was also one of those projects where the slope of my learning curve remained steep all the way through. Personally, I think that's a good thing, knowing the extent of your knowledge base and having the willingness to keep in mind that really important things may be on the periphery of what you're most comfortable with. So rather than being vague, here's the constructs, constructs of my project that was titled Seafood Hydrocarbon Safety and Coastal Community Health. The communities we were working with had notable concerns about how the oil spill impacted their fisheries and their harvests. Their concerns focused on the oil spill related contaminants. Most every one of the communities had heard countless reports from NOAA, the FDA, the White House, and state and local agencies that seafood was safe. Gulf seafood is the most tested seafood in the world, they'd say, and it's safe. And this message was broadcast on television, radio, in newspapers, and in podcasts. Yet most folks had a tough time believing that seafood was really safe in light of the 4.9 million barrels of oil released and the general feeling that something remained wrong. And so the question became, why is this perception so pervasive? Is there truth to their concerns? Although thousands of seafood samples had been collected and tested by state and federal agencies in the northern Gulf, the seafood was deemed safe. Why had inshore seafood not been tested as much? And why were the effective communications so ineffective? Several factors contributed to concerns about the safety of Gulf seafood in coastal communities. Many Gulf Coast residents felt that seafood in their communities, the seafood types that they ate, was never tested. And that seafood consumption patterns in their communities were not represented by the use of national statistics on seafood consumption patterns and their body weight. And these factors are used in risk assessments. It turns out that they were right on both counts. And that coupled with relatively poor communications from 
federal agencies that were often overshadowed by the blogosphere and social and conventional media set the stage for confusion and overall a real mess. So my project as part of this multidisciplinary team has me representing an environmental scientist and I investigated seafood safety with my team after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and conducted analytical toxicology on relevant seafood samples. We discerned seafood consumption patterns in Gulf Coast communities, what types of seafood people eat, how often they ate it, and their portion sizes. And we're now working to put these data together to develop a risk assessment for our coastal communities based on what they eat, how much they eat, and their portion sizes, and of course the seafood that they are catching and harvesting. So this way, in the end, if there's actually a certain type of seafood in certain regions that remains tainted with oil spill-related contaminants, people need to know that, and our job is to protect public health. But on the other hand, if seafood is really safe, they need to know that too, and more importantly, they need to believe it. We worked in geographically distinct communities spanning the Big Bend region of Florida, heading west to Mobile Bay, Alabama. Our community partners and associates provided guidance and at times an easy entrance to engage with communities to collect the seafood samples, conduct seafood consumption surveys, and let folks know about and discuss our project. We visited with people at fishing piers, seafood festivals, and at other community gatherings. Time spent in the field with community members was one of the greatest project efforts, and ultimately one of the greatest project assets. Working with citizens and seafood workers afforded me the time to get to know one another and learn about community health concerns and issues. That investment over time allowed folks to get to know us in turn, and slowly, trust evolved to whatever extent it was going to. And from experience, as I'm sure many of you know, trust doesn't happen overnight, nor even after days of engagement. It happens over periods of many months and years. This type of time commitment, particularly for a principal investigator, may not be very common. You know, often researchers send project coordinators or postdocs and technicians into the field to facilitate the research needs. Now, while it's a great experience for graduate students to interact this way um, as part of community-based science, it's not the same as the PI being regularly engaged and putting in the face time. It puts a very different spin on the relationship between the project and the community. I have tried to follow several basic rules, and I don't need to be pedantic here, but let me share them with you. I only try to promise what I can deliver. I try to deliver what I can promise. Show up and be present. They're not really the same, necessarily. Be a good listener. And in the end, do what you can to be part of the community in a reasonable and professional way. If environmental scientists and academes were perceived as some part of the community, they might actually be viewed as a resource. What a concept. It would likely come with some form of two-way buy-in, like trust and honesty, and a willingness to provide support as needed. This is absolutely not part of what most students are trained for in the sciences about the real relationship. So take fisheries management as a science, for example. Fisheries managers are commonly taught how to manage fisheries using a variety of assessment tools, from boats and nets and surveys, hydrodynamics, statistics, and reporting. But commonly absent is the one variable that affects fisheries practically universally, practically universally. The fishers. Perception and beliefs are tightly connected here. For both communities and managers, right, 
Perception and beliefs are integrally woven into the fabric of how people perambulate in a variety of situations. That, for example, is why many folks in inland America reduce their consumption of tilapia and Chilean farm salmon because of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. All right. So here's where the cross-disciplinary support from folks like Brian, Lynn, our communications experts, and Sima came in handy. For me, understanding the psychological and social dimensions of how communities respond under different circumstances was enlightening. So in this situation, I needed to account for what the communities needed to hear from me as a scientist. It was not a matter of what I learned and wanted to communicate to them, if that makes sense. That paradigm is actually true for any good communication, knowing your audience. But in this case, people were angry after the oil spill. There was a lot of misinformation and what I call disinformation. Fisheries were closed. Jobs were lost, and for many, livelihoods and dreams went into stasis. At the same time, there was a downturn in the national economy, and some changes, both natural and anthropogenic, that environmentally affected Gulf Coast communities were occurring. Right? Nothing was simple. BP gave out dollars to those whose livelihoods were affected. A lot of them. The distribution of these civil penalties did not always have a sense of fairness either. And in fact, it was downright divisive in many communities. And it was easy to blame BP for everything. It turns out that this kind of blame for lost jobs, declining fisheries, and failed family and community cohesiveness is all corrosive and counterproductive to being resilient. And I'm counting on Brian to talk more about that. I wouldn't be talking about this if it wasn't for Brian. But these kinds of insights have proved invaluable as my team interacted within communities to collect seafood samples and implement seafood consumption surveys. I've learned to see at least a little bit through Brian and Lynn's eyes and better understand where different folks are coming from. And most importantly, how my science needed to be meaningful, not just in the scientific community and in peer-reviewed publications, but for these communities and these people. What a great opportunity. This construct has given greater meaning and a new voice to my research program. My science has been strengthened by what I've learned from working directly with seafood workers and the community members that we've engaged with in this project. Engaging with Brian and Lynn and working within communities as a team has been transformative. Our team outreach experts have provided clarity on how to communicate clearly, honestly, and meaningfully with a range of audiences. And let me tell you, there's been a range. And although you can't please everybody, being a human being underneath the lab coat has great value. As a human being, you can relate to people as another human being. And as a scientist, you can merge away from the concept of doing it to them to doing it with them. Sima Finn, our NIEHS program project officer, along with Claudia Thompson, who comes more from the toxicology end of the spectrum, has been remarkably supportive in our consortium efforts. She's worked hard to foster a sense of community between our consortium research team and three other consortia focusing on public health outcomes from the oil spill. And as a program officer, she's fulfilled her mission to provide oversight and guidance to these large and complex projects. But as I hope Simba will share with you shortly, her personal insights as a human, right, as Sima, have uniquely contributed to the scientific mission here. Sima has helped to set the tone and bar for consortium expectations. And Sima, as I, I'd like to go as far as to call you a cheerleader for our program efforts. And you've really reinforced the importance of community engagement 
in conducting science for today and for what's needed tomorrow. So let me bring this to a close with some final thoughts about collaboration and community engagement. Collaboration isn't only needed in Gulf Coast communities to do good science. It's needed in scientific communities, too. The Seafood Safety Project that I briefly described could not have been possible if not for at least nine other additional collaborating scientists who were directly part of my Seafood Safety Project team within the consortium. These folks brought multiple disciplines and needed expertise to the table, without which the project could not have flown. And these disciplines included analytical toxicology, food science and human nutrition, geography and GIS, epidemiology, risk assessment and risk communication, and community outreach. As a team, we were able to address research issues more readily due to the broad functional resources available through our team. And then there were the resources shared from other teams within our consortium, like Bryant's and Lynn's. We learned through our research that people and communities are different. Embracing these differences, however, permits bridling a diversity of strengths. Had we thought of the entire Gulf Coastal region as similar in our study, we would have certainly sold everybody short. As scientists, we can serve as needed and valued resources, not just for other sciences, but for the community too. And I would think that the opposite is true as well. Community engagement, as this project demonstrated, is an integral part of community-based science. You can't think of community interactions and research as a checkbox. But when scientific community interactions are real, outcomes can be meaningful. So thanks for the opportunity to contribute to this session. Brian, Sima, I'll leave it in your good hands. That was a really eloquent and thoughtful um, reflection on our work. And now it gives me great pleasure to talk, uh, introduce Brian Mayer from University of Arizona. There we go. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so one of the things that I've learned in the last five years of working on this NIHS project is it's really a pain to follow Andy. <laughs> uh, I've watched three drafts uh, of that video in the last week, um, and I know that it got better. I promise. One of the great things about Andy appearing on video is I get to make fun of him because he's not in the room. Um, one of the amazing things about uh, participating in, in this project ha has really been uh, working with Andy uh, as well as Lynn, who's been alluded to. Uh, I love Andy like a brother, and it's been a really amazing opportunity to try and mold him into a good social scientist. Uh, but at the same time, I've been unable to resist him shaping some of my thoughts uh, regarding environmental science, particularly when it comes to exposure science. And so if I start talking to you about telomeres or cortisol or things like this later on today, it's, it's really Andy's fault. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you uh, to a number of people before I get started. Uh, I'll try and keep things moving along. I don't want to be sitting between you and lunch. Um, first, let me say thank you to Phil. Um, Phil uh, has been a wonderful mentor for me. I was uh, there at Brown University before we called it SURG. Um, I was the second graduate student that Phil brought on through uh, Robert Wood Johnson and then an NSF grant uh, to start looking at contested environmental illnesses. And so my experience at Brown has very much shaped uh, who I am today. So thank you, Phil, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you to NIHS for providing the support to do the Deepwater Horizon. And uh, this is my team. Uh, Andy was thanking his team. Uh, I was at the University of Florida for six years and during uh, when the BP oil spill hit, and so I was at Florida while the team was coming together and then for several years of research before then moving to the University of Arizona. 
So Andy can't be here today because he's organizing an outreach presentation at the Florida Folk Festival, one of the largest folk festivals in the South, and Andy is responsible for a lot of that. Uh, I'm traveling to the South uh, to do presentations on community resiliency on Monday and Tuesday, uh, so a lot of us are moving in and out of that region. So Andy gave you a broad overview of what the project looks like, and I wanted to tell a story uh, about Andy. Uh, particularly about uh, the collaboration between he and I when it came to thinking about what our project could do for these Gulf Coast communities that were facing uh, the slow-moving specter of contamination. And you have to remember, early in the summer of 2010, if most of you are from New England, you probably at least saw CNN's bubbler uh, showing that the Deepwater Horizon well was leaking. Uh, but in Florida, we were all very concerned that the oil was going to be caught up by the Gulf Stream and not only hit our western Gulf Coast, but move through the Keys and up into the eastern uh, coast as well. And so Andy, myself, uh, Lynn, and our project director, Dr. Morris, uh, would travel to various communities and say, here's what we want to do. Uh, part of the NIHS project is that it has to be collaborative. There has to be a CDPR component. What are you interested in? And we were in one particular meeting, and I wish I had a PDF scan uh, of this document. Uh, but essentially, I was sitting next to a, a seafood worker that was uh, responsible for managing the Seafood Association. And she was doing something like this. Um, she was just scribbling uh, on our sort of very simple Venn diagram or flow chart of how the organization would work and just looking at Andy and just scratching the heck uh, out of her piece of paper and being like, and we were like, well, what's, what's wrong? Um, you know, why aren't you interested in learning about whether or not the seafood is safe? And she said, of course the seafood is safe. And the only thing that can result from you coming in here and testing and proving that it's safe is someone saying that your test was wrong and it is in fact not safe. That it would in fact be better to not have any uh, samples or any tests at all than there would be to have ones that were negative. Uh, and you can see how committed Andy was to just answering that question of proving that the seafood was safe, uh, how sort of hurt that he felt by that. And I had to say, Andy, it's not the presence of PAHs, it's not the presence of hydrocarbons, it's not the presence of the other things that you might be looking for, it's perception, and perceptions matter. And so I think I've been successful based on that video in molding him into my little junior social scientist uh, <laughs> to get him to start thinking about uh, the role of perceptions and perceptions matter. And certainly when it came to our study region, in this case the Eastern Gulf Coast, it was perceptions that mattered. Most of the regions that we were working were, were fortunate to not experience very heavy oiling. As Andy said, we were working as far west from Florida as Mobile Bay in Alabama, and they received some light oiling there. But for the most part, the state of Florida received only minor tar balls, if no oil whatsoever. But we would still see, in this case, this is a Chicago food festival that was proudly displaying uh, that their seafood, that their lobster, probably not from the Gulf, uh, anyhow, uh, but especially the shrimp, uh, were not coming from the Gulf. Uh, and this was a reason why you should come and buy their food. And so various agencies, uh, ranging from NOAA to the FDA, were implementing a variety of programs. On the top, uh, this is one of our outreach people, uh, Steve, oh, blanking on his name, but I'll come back to it, uh, doing seafood sniffing. Uh, so the FDA implemented this program that said, we're going to hire a bunch of community people and scientists to sniff the seafood. And if they were able, don't, don't laugh, uh, that if they were able to smell oil, that meant that there was oil. And conversely, if they could not smell oil, that meant that there was no oil. Uh, and so from my sort of sociology of science perspective, was just blown away that this was a federally funded project designed to create trust in a region devastated by the oil spill could be solved by people's noses. Um, <laughs> we know that it didn't go over very well uh, in the communities that we worked in. But what we realized from this point moving forward was that this was going to be a very charged environment, ranging from the multi-billion dollar lawsuits that BP would certainly be facing, federal fines, compensation payouts, work programs, and so on and so forth. And in order to be successful, that all of our individual projects, ranging from the psychology project, to my community resilience project, to Andy's toxicology project, would have to be working together in close synchronicity in order to be successful. 
And so I, I tried to spend some time thinking about uh, what was sort of the value added by my presentation here today. And I've given plenty of oil spill talks before, but I really wanted to think about uh, sort of echoing Phil's recent article uh, and team's article in environmental health perspectives of whether or not we were accomplishing transdisciplinary research or whether or not this was just multidisciplinary. Were we sort of working on a, pro on a problem from a variety of perspectives or were we working together? And as Andy argued that we did start from the basic premise that protecting uh, against these risks from whether or not it was uh, environmental exposure or consumption exposure to any types of toxicants from the Deepwater Horizon spill would require more than just outreach and communication. It would have to require some type of transdisciplinary science that required us to work together, but also to be working in partnership with communities and finding partners uh, that could help guide and inform the research. So my project, uh, Project 2, titled A Community-Based Assessment of Social Vulnerability and Community Resilience, started from the sociology of disaster. And so right away, when the Deepwater Horizon oil spill hit, the first and obvious comparison would be the Exxon Valdez disaster. Um, and we knew from that disaster that the first suicide occurred three years later, after the herring industry had collapsed. Residents of Cordova, as well as other coastal areas uh, in the Prince William Sound, spent decades, some 29 years, litigating against Exxon, and only came away with a few thousand dollars in the worst cases, and sometimes $100,000 in the best cases. But it took nearly three decades. And the one thing we knew from a social science perspective was the participation in that litigation process. The fear of an uncertain future led to social disruption, and Andy used that term, community corrosion. So I approached the BP oil spill in which the first suicide due to the oil spill didn't take three years, it only took three months. And so right away we had reason to be concerned that this type of community corrosion would take hold and we would see the dissolution of social bonds and people would become very anomic and start to sort of suffer and their mental health uh, would deteriorate. So I wanted to do something where we could measure baseline levels of vulnerability we could do some ethnographic and qualitative research where we talk to people about their perceptions about both the oil spill as well as the future, and then look specifically at the role of social capital in preventing against that type of community corrosion. And what the project proposal eventually evolved into was a look at resilience. Uh, and this has become a new buzz, uh, buzz phrase, buzzword, buzzword. Uh, that's really taken hold uh, through various scientific communities as well as various federal uh, funding agencies. And I think it represents uh, some problems, uh, but also some opportunities, especially when we start talking about socio-ecological resilience and the interaction between ecological systems and community systems and how they prevent against disaster. And so my emphasis is on looking at community resilience, or in other words, the ability of a community to uh, thrive, uh, to survive uh, and both improve themselves in the face of uncertainty. Uh, oftentimes this is a metaphor for adaptive capacity. Uh, we see those words uh, used interchangeably. But the idea of resilience, I think, is very powerful because it represents not just an equilibrium. And that's one of the things that is problematic about using some indicators that are out there for example, vulnerability that says a community is vulnerable because it has so many people that do this and a lack of people that do that, it doesn't really represent an opportunity to move forward. So if we think of resilience as a process, as a rather than an outcome uh, that should be multi-hazard, that really gives us an opportunity to intervene, to both measure and try and improve the places in which we're working. And I think uh, that our Florida-based Deepwater Horizon project is doing a pretty good job of that. My project uh, uses community-based participatory research across four field sites, uh, ranging from Alabama, where we're partnered with the Alabama Seafood Association, uh, Pensacola, where we work with Citizens Against Toxic Exposures, the Apalachicola region, sorry you can't read that in the purple, where we work with Franklin's Promise Coalition, and a control community all the way to the east in Cedar Key, where we work with the Cedar Key Aquaculture Association. What we try and do is we try and measure the relationship between both individual resilience and community resilience in terms of predicting mental health outcomes. And I think this has been one of our best contributions, academically speaking, uh, that we have a lot to owe to NIEHS, and particularly Claudia and Sima, for putting together working groups, in this case this is a resilience working group, 
where we've thought about how a variety of different data sets can interact in order to protect against public health. So you have myself working at the upper level, thinking about different forms of capital, human, economic, social, and political capital, and how those interact with individual resilience attributes, how people cope with individual resources, what risk perceptions they might have, and how those interact through the mechanism of social capital in order to protect against mental health uh, problems. And so even though each one of us is working on our own separate parts, we're all trying to piece together pieces of data in order to make this model work. And not only are we doing this at the University of Florida and Arizona, uh, but we're also doing that across the whole Deepwater Consortia and trying to work with other universities that are collecting their own data sets. What you don't see here uh, is the environmental health science. And we've been debating this for a long time about whether or not there's a room for cortisol in our individual resilience attributes. Is cortisol a biomarker of individual resilience? And that's not a debate that our resilience working group has answered right yet. Uh, we're continuing to work on that and trying to think about how we can bring in our environmental health uh, colleagues uh, more, but there's still a lot of debates about where uh, those types of individual biomarkers fit into models like this. My emphasis, again, is on community resilience, where we're thinking about the interaction in particular of economic uh, development as well as social capital. And so these are various uh, statistics that we can pull from the U.S. Census as well as other sources. We've done this and tried to predict uh, what were baseline levels of vulnerability and resilience in the areas in which we're working, including the whole South. Uh, and we see, for the most part, uh, areas that are gray have either moderate levels of vulnerability and moderate levels of resilience. Areas that are red have low resilience and high vulnerability, and areas that are blue have uh, high resilience and low vulnerability. So they're good, the red are bad. One of the field sites in which we're working, Franklin County, is in that bad area. Uh, the rest of them are sort of scoring in the middle. So we take those indicators as a baseline and say, these are reasons that we should suspect community corrosion, problems to ensue, mental health problems, particularly in Franklin County, and then to a lesser degree in some of these other counties. Um, and we've tried to make sense of how that helps us understand resilience. When it comes to community resilience, we divide that up into two categories. Formal resilience being that economic development, where adaptive capacity, the ability to respond to disasters, learn from those crises, and improve one's setting, is really dependent upon the availability of resources. Whether or not these are small businesses, access to loans, employment rates, education, and so on, uh, the idea here is that we can enhance resilience by improving economic growth, reducing inequality, and diversifying industrial sectors. But when it comes to public health interventions, I don't know about the rest of you, but this tends to fall out of the scope of what we can really do. Uh, a lot of people say, how do we improve resilience given that what we've told us? We say, well, you need to diversify your industrial sector. <laughs> and they say, okay, well, thanks. Uh, we didn't know that before. That's not really useful. Um, instead, it tends to be the informal side of resilience, where we see a lot of traction, or at least a lot of possibility, for improving resilience by addressing social capital, by making ties, by improving network ties, both that we could think of as being strong as well as weak ties. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, a very basic primer on network analysis. Uh, there are different forms of social capital. We tend to think of bonding capital as relationships that we have to people that are similar to us and that are close to us. These are your friends and your family. There are people that are also similar to us that we don't have quite as close relationships with. And those can be other groups that we don't interact with all the time. And that's linked to us by bridging capital. And then there are those that aren't like us. Uh, there are people that occupy higher bureaucratic positions, higher on sort of uh, any type of hierarchy, decision makers, politicians, agency officials, things like that, uh, that are linked to the rest of us by linking capital. And so essentially in the, in the interventions that we've tried to design uh, post-spill, we're really focusing on bridging capital and linking capital and trying to make connections between groups uh, that wouldn't otherwise be working together as well as to those occupying higher positions in some type of authoritative hierarchy that increase an area's resilience. And Andy's doing that right now. Do these things matter? Well, in fact, when we connect them to various outcomes, social capital does matter a lot. 
so this is one of the, these are data from one of our field sites. This is a fishing village uh, where we've surveyed about 300 people and measured their social capital and their social networks. Uh, on the left, we see someone that is highly dense but has low heterogeneity. This person knows a lot of people and they are very, very, very close to them, but they're also very, very much like that individual person. Uh, and it turns out that that person was very less likely to access certain key resources. In this case, BP's various programs paying people for their losses. But they were more likely to participate in work opportunities. So essentially what we've concluded from this individual is that there's a lot of social stigma about taking a handout. The idea that they were hurt by the oil spill meant that they were weak, that they were vulnerable to being, being hurt, and that taking a type of handout would represent further weakness. So they felt very trapped in that network. The person on, the, on your left, my right, uh, however, uh, no, other way around, your right, my left, um, very, very less dense, uh, but had higher degree of heterogeneity, and they were more likely to file for compensation, but less likely to access those work programs. And this is true, we're finding, for mental health outcomes. Uh, it turns out that the people in the much denser networks are having less mental health problems than the ones in the more disparate networks. But as Andy pointed out, resilience occurs in a very cultural setting. Uh, when we talk to people to try and make sense of how these mechanisms were working, most people really shed the compensation process in a very negative light. Uh, they felt that they were sort of misled about being made whole. They felt that they weren't probably compensated. So there was a type of secondary level of trauma, not only having experienced the oil spill, but also being misled to things could be made better quickly. So what we've learned is that the formal and the informal, uh, when it comes to resilience, don't often match well. And what our social science has really been meant to do is try to make sense of how we could make the formal match the informal better. Um, so I just want to conclude briefly with some final thoughts on, on this question of have we achieved this idea of, of transdisciplinary project or transdisciplinary research. The model that I think has worked well for us, when I say us I mean Andy, the psychologist, Lynn Grant and myself, is that Andy's been really successful in training lay scientists. He is working with fishers, oystermen, to collect their own environmental health data to take samples, to test samples, and to learn about the safety of their own seafood. In my attempts then to build social capital, especially when it comes to linking those fishing populations to the agency managers that are managing those fisheries that before discredited them as being ignorant schlubs, now they're able to say, hey, we have data, we're working with the University of Florida, we know how to do this on their own, you need to listen to us now. This is empowering them, leveling the table, and we believe creating more social capital, making that community more resilient overall when it comes to the future. Uh, I have a few final lessons, just go through really quickly. The first one is, NIHS has been fundamental. Uh, I have a lot of thanks that I owe to Sima as well as Claudia. You guys have done a wonderful job in forcing us to work together, encouraging us to work together. <laughs> it's a U19, so money is sort of dependent each year, so we have to do a good job. The, success, the successes that I've talked about here haven't occurred in every one of our field sites. Uh, we sort of have a 50-50 success rate right now, which is pretty good. It could be better. The presentation I actually started to prepare for this conference was thinking about why it worked in some places and not in others, and I would love to talk more about that in the future. And it's taken a lot of time. Uh, we're five years into this project, and Andy and I are still coming up with new ideas, trying to get things to work, preparing for the future. Sima, fund us more. Um, <laughs> But it's really taken a lot of time and investment to do this. We weren't doing this in the first couple of years. We really hit our stride in our third and our fourth year. We're in our fifth year, fifth year now, and I hope we continue to do well in the future. So thank you very much. I love the way this, uh, this session is kind of bringing us from, uh, you know, or, an orientation to the grant and then seeing how pieces of the grant fit together and now I th I'm really looking forward to hearing Sima tell us more about sort of what's going on in some of the other field sites. Do I have to turn anything on with this? No, you're okay. Thanks very much. I'm really honored to be here today and I also want to thank Phil and Julie and the other organizers for putting together one of the most interesting meetings I've had the pleasure to attend in a long time. I understand all the talks. <laughs> um, 
and I'm very happy to be here today to have a chance to share with you my perspective on how social science is being incorporated into environmental health sciences. My talk will brief, briefly cover my reaction to the two talks ahead of me by Andy and Brian. I'll talk to you a bit about NIEHS support for social and behavioral science research and NIH interests in social and behavioral research. I, I want to get a little into the weeds and tell you some typical acad activities that I as a social scientific program officer do. And then specific um, uh, activities that I uh, related to my interactions with federal colleagues and grantees and my responsibilities for community engaged research programs. So first, Deepwater Horizon as a case study of a collaboration. I'm really glad, and I actually had these notes before hearing these presentations, but I also think that this program exemplifies transdisciplinary research. It moves beyond multidisciplinary programs where investigators with distinct experience separately consider a central research question or contribute data in specific areas without necessarily interacting with or combining their expertise in program activities. Instead, as both Andy and Brian noted in their talks, the consortium raised the capacity of not just the community partners to participate and understand the science, but also influenced the investigators, many who learned each other's science and improved considerably their skills in communicating in plain English and in meaningful terms to affected stakeholders and partners in the research. More on this later. Um, I want to react specifically to some of the things Andy brought up. Um, he touched upon many of the non-scientific elements of research, time spent to build trust, taking seriously the perception of risk, listening, um, being a part of the community. These people live in the same communities now that Brian's moved away. And what communities want to hear, communicating what communities want to hear. But I also want to reference something Julia mentioned earlier to put the context for where this study occurred. This is an area that represents a slow moving disaster. Uh, this is a disaster prone area that's been hit by hurricane after hurricane, floods, um, economic hardship. And this is in the context of very low SES, extensive poverty, uh, and health disparities mostly based on the lack of access to care. So I'm showing the same slide that Gwen Coleman showed earlier about NIEHS investments related to social science. I've color-coded the programs to show you the ones that I worked on. Um, and I'm glad she also called out uh, environmental justice as a key program that wasn't shown on this chart. I came on board at NIEHS in December 2011 and was assigned responsibilities for Breast Cancer and Environment Research Program and the Deepwater Horizon Program, and as a point of contact for social scientific communications, health literacy, and health disparities projects. My work builds off the efforts of those who came before me, specifically Alan Deary, Fred Tyson, Liam O'Fallon, and my colleague Shoba Srinivasan, who you'll hear from later today. They developed and implemented programs and stimulated interest in social science as a viable topic within environmental health sciences. They set the groundwork for my current efforts and helped educate other program staff about the importance of incorporating social scientific methods and expertise into environmental health science programs especially those programs with community-engaged focus. Some of the activities that I specifically undertook on the programs I worked on, Breast Cancer and the Environment um, Centers, uh, Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Program, Gwen mentioned that a major focus of the program was to ensure that new findings are disseminated to girls and women at risk. To meet this goal, I worked with staff in National Cancer Institute and a marketing consultant to create toolkits for a specific audience that highlight the findings and actionable recommendations. These field kits were subsequently field tested by our community partners and are now available on the website and as downloadable documents. Um, understanding and promoting uh, health literacy. When this NIH program was re-announced in 2010, I signed on on behalf of NIHS 
and develop topic areas for inclusion in the funding announcement that reflect NIEHS strategic goals for research. I've also helped Liam O'Fallon organize an annual PEPH meeting around the topic of environmental health literacy that many of you attended. And he and I have written a commentary about the emergence of this distinct subfield of health literacy that has been accepted by Environmental Health Perspectives Journal and is currently in editorial review. But perhaps my most important initial assignment was to help finalize the funding announcement for research to action and to manage projects that, as Gwen mentioned, use the full involvement of community <coughs> members in all stages of the research. We currently support six projects under that program. A few more are in the pipeline for funding. And um, it has attracted projects that truly reflect CBPR principles of engagement, especially equity in community academic partners, partnerships. But my responsibilities are not confined to NIEHS programs and projects. One of my first trans-NIH experiences as a program officer was to participate in the 2012 Behavioral and Social Science Retreat. Over 400 NIH employees attended, a number that stunned many of us, although many were behavioral scientists, primarily from the field of psychology. I did have the opportunity to meet other anthropologists and sociologists from many of the institutes and centers with a strategic interest in supporting behavioral and social science research. This is a graphic that I presented at the retreat that shows NIEHS investment in behavioral and social science research from 2008 to 2012. One uh, important opportunity that arose uh, that came out of my involvement in the retreat was that uh, other anthropologists working in the Minority Health and Health Disparities Institute, National Cancer Institute, and Center for Scientific Review and I established an anthropology research interest group at NIH. The five of us started. It now counts over 30 members and meets on a monthly basis. But after the retreat, I gave a lot of thought to the growth in social science interest at NIH and realized that it reflects larger social movements that are affecting the research enterprise. This includes really greatly increased interest in social determinants of health and the fuller integration of these into the biomedical research paradigm. A real increase in the, the uh, quality and number of community engaged research and community academic partnerships, citizen science, and its potential to change how knowledge is created, what constitutes knowledge, what is validated data, who owns it, and who determines what should be explored and studied. I think social media and the availability of scientific information of variable quality is also affecting our need to uh, learn to communicate better and address miscommunications. Addressing health disparities in particularly vulnerable communities, which in some cases is congressionally mandated, and in particular attention to immigrant and border communities, Native American tribal communities, and inner city African American, Hispanic, Asian communities, and the relation of ongoing social inequities with health disparities. I think that more attention is being paid to improving cultural sensitivity in biomedical and environmental health science research and increasing the diversity of the scientific workforce. It's my belief that social scientists at NIHS are the best suited to move these topics forward and to ensure that the research enterprise appropriately involves and informs the public. I'd like to go a little further into the weeds here with a quick overview of what a program officer does and how this might be different for social scientists at NIH. Much of what I do is very similar to other program officers at NIH. I'm charged with developing programs in specific areas of research including emerging topics like fracking. I'm assigned a portfolio of grants in my topic areas, serve on committees and working groups, organize meetings and workshops, present at national society meetings, write articles and commentaries, and do strategic planning for the institute or for specific programs. In fact, my first day on the job was our strategic planning retreat, and I was glad to be able to get a couple topics into that plan, <clears throat> and have subsequently worked closely with the health disparities and communications um, strategic implementation teams. 
Also, like other um, program officers, a great deal of my time is spent mentoring and interacting with current and potential grantees and other federal staff. My, I've been charged to mentor primarily to guide social scientists new to NIH and NIEHS about funding mechanisms, about how to construct their projects, not for NSF funding, but for the different type of focus that NIH has, to guide social scientists to other institutes and centers as appropriate, or to other investigators working in similar areas for possible collaboration. I'm doing that a lot lately with Native American investigators who are contacting me who are working in complementary areas. Um, Mentoring has also been to work with community members, uh, community partners, community organizations, and tribal members regarding resources to build their capacity, health literacy, to provide guidance about creating equitable partnerships, and um, how to work with investigators or when to seek their own funding, and importantly, to guide understanding about how to turn community needs into research questions. And I also work with um, grantees to develop webinars and sessions of presentations at national meetings. In addition, a particular charge that all of us at NIEH have is to raise awareness of the environmental contributions to health and disease um, and the combined impact of social determinants of health in the context of environmental exposures at particular susceptible windows or across the lifespan. In my interactions with other federal agents, agencies and with other institutes and centers across NIH, I frequently raise this issue and request inclusion of environmental issues in broad discussions about addressing health disparities or raising health literacy. This approach is particularly attractive to me as an anthropologist as it reflects a more holistic understanding of what constitutes health and disease and the many different factors that heighten risk. Uh, than the sometimes more disease or organ-specific mission that many agencies and institutes have that guide how they think of health. My initial portfolio included the Deepwater Horizon projects and uh, some research to action projects. My current, uh, which was about six grants, my current portfolio of over 55 projects reflects the overall NIEHS funding in social scientific and population studies. The topics I oversee are shown on this uh, slide, and I want to point out one thing that I separate out community-based participatory research, which is primarily outreach, the provision of education, and um, perhaps a bit unidirectional uh, information coming out of academia, to community-based participatory research that is more community-engaged, that reflects our strategic goal and bidirectional communication. Another important area of responsibility, as I mentioned, is the organizations of meetings and workshops and presentations at national meetings. I've helped organize two tribal environmental meetings. The second of these, the value of tribal ecological knowledge to environmental health sciences and biomedical research, will be held this December at NIH in Bethesda. Um, I've organized seven grantee meetings for the Research to Action BSERP and Deepwater Horizon programs six PEPH webinars primarily focused on Native American environmental health disparities and risk communication, and have organized sessions for two Society for Applied Anthropology meetings. One of them was on the role of social science in environmental health science. Uh, an upcoming session uh, at the uh, AAAS meeting on climate change and aging, and sessions related to disaster and resilience research for the Gulf of Mexico Research Institute, uh, abstracts for APHA on health disparities and uh, environmental health disparities, environmental health literacy for PPH. What may also be different for a social scientist working at NIH is my ability to represent the community perspective to scientists and federal employees. This has been particularly helpful in internal and transfederal discussions about citizen science, the greater incorporation of social determinants of health into biomedical and environmental health sciences research, the value of diversity, and in particular, how to operationalize cultural sensitivity in community-engaged research. It's one thing to encourage people to do it. It's another for them to figure out how, if that's not their background. 
I also feel it essential to highlight for scientific colleagues the rigor and the theoretical frameworks underlying social scientific disciplines. Many do not understand, for example, the rigor of communications research, thinking it's the production of fact sheets, or the theoretical frameworks and methodologies used in the analysis of qualitative data. Uh, my interactions with other NIH and federal staff has resulted in joint funding announcements, such as the Research to Action or BSERP programs, on coordination of jointly funded programs. Uh, we are just now considering a funding the NIH EPA Centers of Excellence for Environmental Health Disparities Research. We also participate in the Native American Research Centers for Health, which is trans-agency Now, back to the deep water horizon. Oops. As noted early, uh, um, we didn't note it early, sorry. At our uh, recent meeting in uh, 2015, we designed uh, technical sessions. Our institute director was there, and the scientists were there, and they were the typical scientific talks in the morning. But then we devoted a day a session in the afternoon the following day specifically for the community partners. These sessions focus on explaining what the findings they had heard in the technical talks meant for them as residents of the Gulf Coast. We did this because we believe this is why individuals participate in research as one means to getting in important information. In this case, about how disaster in the region was affecting them and their families' health. To assist in that effort, I developed a slide template for the scientific investigators to help them develop presentations that would be understanding and meaningful to the community partners. An excerpt of that template is shown on the next slide. I've highlighted uh, some of the guidance to the investigators. I believe it is not enough to encourage the investigators to present findings in plain English. You have to give them specific examples that are relevant to the science they are describing. I also provided a specific format to follow that in essence flips the order of most scientific presentations and like news stories gets to the overall point first, gives relatively few details about how the data was collected and analyzed, and particularly requested by our community partners, and goes beyond the description of statistical findings to note what the results mean for individuals. At Andy's urging, I'll now show, now show you the slides that I presented at that community partners session. Um, this was intended to highlight the role that the community partners played in the consortium, but also reflects my particular perspective as an anthropologist, that people are at the heart of environmental health studies. What I noted at the meeting was, at most grantee meetings, one gets to hear about the scientific findings. However, there's one central fact about research that tends to get overlooked in scientific meetings. Research is about people. And by people, I don't just mean those who participate in the studies and those affected by the scientific issue under study. I also mean the people who conduct the studies, the scientists, and those who develop the program and fund the studies. We bring our own humanity to research our perspectives, our cultural backgrounds, our attitudes and biases, and our hearts and minds. And despite the emphasis on the intellectual contributions of scientists and federal funders, research with populations, as Andy talked about in his presentation, also entails some degree of caring, some level of concern, and some degree of commitment to making a difference, mitigating harm, and preventing illness. The human side of scientists is very much a part of research. I'm showing this slide because this was the other social scientist involved in the research, um, did historical uh, record review to put the context of the current disasters, but he was the only one who showed us what were the ethnic subpopulations involved in the research. This is a slide that shows the community organizations. There were over 45 active community organizations involved in the research. But these were the people, and these were the slides that I showed at the meeting um, because these were the people who were there. Um, many of the community partners served on the working groups and committees. Uh, some of them are shown here. Tap Bui, who represented the Vietnamese committee. Joe Taylor, 
uh, a community activist from Franklin's Promise, a barrier island whose fishing and tourism were heavily affected. Sharon and David Gote of Cajuns, who represented their community. And Therese Carter, and uh, of course I show Andy, and the picture, the gentleman with the glasses, that's Craig Colton, whose slide I just showed. Almost my final slide. Um, I'd like to especially acknowledge, as they did, the community outreach people. Um, these are some pictures of their field work. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge how much the investigators like Andy and Brian have interacted with the community partners and benefited from this interaction. Again, for me as an anthropologist, this program has been and will continue to be a true example of partnership and capacity building. I'd like to conclude by reiterating what I think are my key roles as an anthropologist, to represent the rigor and theoretical principles of social science to scientific colleagues, and to highlight the value of social science for the research paradigm to stimulate interest in environmental health sciences among social scientists, to ensure the equity of community academic partners, and to bring the humanistic element to the forefront in research. Thank you very much.